Good morning, everybody. Uh, last night, you saw a sneak preview of the story about the Freedom From Religion Foundation and our new statue of Clarence Darrow in front of the Ray County Courthouse, home of the Scopes trial in Dayton, Tennessee. The renowned sculptor who created that work of public art is here today to tell you a little more about the amazing story of how he and FFRF have ensured that evolution is represented there, not just creationism. Zenos Fridakis is a renowned sculptor known for his public monuments, portrait statues, busts, and figurative sculptures. He has created an extensive award-winning collection of more than 100 bronze sculptures in public and private collections. His work includes sculptures of historic figures such as Benjamin Franklin, Albert Einstein, General Eisenhower, and Sir Winston Churchill. Freedom, his best known sculpture, has become an internet icon inspiring many in their quest to break free from boundaries. It has been listed in the top 10 public art by The Independent. The oldest of five children growing up in Greek culture, Zenos admired, respected, and was drawn to Greek sculpture. Greek art influenced his aesthetic vision, and additional inspiration came from sculptors Michelangelo, Bernini, Carpeau, and Rodin. Zenos studied by scholarship at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, completing his formal education with a Bachelor of Fine Art and a Master in Fine Art at the University of Pennsylvania. Zenos' emphasis has been the figure and the portrait. He excels at expressing the character and vitality of his subjects while capturing an ac accurate likeness. His portfolio includes figure sculpture, animals, bas reliefs, portraits, both busts and paintings, of living and historical individuals, and poetic philosophical sculpture with a postmodern sensibility. FFRF has been delighted to work with Zenos Fridakis, and we are honored that he is a paying member of the Freedom from Religion Foundation. Please welcome Zenos Fridakis. Thank you. Oh, let's see, get this to work. Okay. I've got a friend of mine to uh, let me use his music. He's a banjo player. Uh, we were in Tennessee, and uh, this is a sculpture of Daryl. And my introduction to the Scopes trial was in seventh grade. I waved this in front of a little girl on stage and said, you was a worm once. And <laughs> I guess the boys don't do that anymore. Now they download pictures of worms for their phone and scare them that way. But um, let me move on. Uh, Inherit the Wind is, uh, you can see that a lot of great uh, actors have played it. In fact, John Delancey was at uh, uh, Tennessee and was part of our program. And uh, Kevin Spacey mentioned the sculpture. And here's part of the Scopes trial. How many people were here last night and saw that little video about the... Oh, see, I don't have to be here now. I can just sit down. <laughs> The interesting thing about sculpture, and I rarely talk, is because I've spent the last 40 years sculpting, and it's, a, it's, it's called frozen music. It's, a, it's something you do without words. And I think one of the advantages of that, Ludwig Wittgenstein said that words can bewitch you, and you have words like unicorn or god or something, and, and you, know, you think it's there because you have the word, but when you're working with sculpture and you don't have words, you're just looking directly at what's real whether you know, it's a table or something. So it helps you get away from that kind of superstition. It's one of the nice things for you, having tried sculpture. Painting and sculpture both demand looking at the real world and, and not seeing it through language. So, just to, Now this is some of the stuff that was happening with the Scopes trial. That was uh, Joe Mandy was um, a popular monkey that was brought to the trial. There was actually a gorilla there too, but he was scared of people and he hid in the corner of his cage. But you can see that uh, and I won't go through the history. All of you, I'm sure, know about the Scopes trial. And I'll talk to you about the sculpture part of it. And this is uh, the Ray County Courthouse. And uh, you can see that there's a sculpture of, of uh, William James Bryan on the left. And there was an empty space on the right. And this is uh, something I read in a book in 2011 that there was just a William James Bryan sculpture. And here's the sculpture. Now, William James Bryan was 65 at the time of the trial. He was an old man, he's balding, he was overweight, he had uh, diabetes, he died five days after the trial. And this, they decided to show the sculpture, show him as a young, sort of handsome man. So it was a kind of a lie right from the beginning. And the sculpture was put there 
as, as a way, instead of putting, let's say, the Ten Commandments on a courthouse lawn, which they would have had a hard time getting away with, I know that Annie Lurie wouldn't let them, uh, and Dan, <laughs> but um, this was a little more subtle because it's history, but yet it's not history, that's there to preach. And you can see from the statement, truth, this was truth, you know, the, telling people that uh, evolution wasn't true, creationism was true. So it was a religious statement, and I, I wanted to change that. Uh, at the time, you can see if, uh, Tom Davis, who was a local historian, said, now that we have this sculpture of, uh, of William James Bryan, we're going to need one of, um, of Clarence Darrow. It took a few years. And there were statements on the sculpture. Again, Christian statesman, orator, and you can see it says, uh, uh, clad in uh, armor of a righteous cause, and the righteous cause is opposing evolution. So... That needed to change, and there's more of that here. And Bryan College, the religious college that was set up after, this is the Bible college, after uh, Bryan died, uh, promoted this sculpture and, and had and sponsored it. So this is another sculpture I did. I'm just showing you, I'm not going to show you all 100 pieces I've done, but I uh, just wanted to show you an example of kind of philosophical, more humanistic pieces I've done. This is a, a one about struggling to break free, and this is a, a book that uh, was in the... the um, Human, uh, Humanist Magazine, and uh, uh, William Dusenberry saw it, and he said to me, you, you ought to do a sculpture of uh, Daryl, and it's something I've been thinking about anyway. And, but the hard thing is you've got to get permission. See, all the people on that book pretty much are humanist. I just did it on my own. And here's a little, just a little snapshot, just parts of it. You can see Darwin and uh, Nietzsche up there in German saying God is dead. And this is at a college. And uh, you can see Galileo and Copernicus telling the people that... Uh, that they're not the center of the universe, and then Protagoras is man is the measure of all things. Anyway, that was my excuse, and I pretty much had to pay for that myself to do this big book sculpture of, of humanists. Um, but um, Mar many of you know, probably know Margaret Downey. She wanted me to meet uh, Annie Laurie. She was coming to Philadelphia to speak at the Ethics Society, and she said, tell her about your idea to do this Daryl sculpture. Maybe she can be helpful. And uh, I went to hear her speak. We had a little dinner beforehand, and she um, seemed interested because uh, Freedom from Religion Foundation had their own history of Dayton, Tennessee. Um, they, the Bryan College was sending, I'm hoping I get this right, uh, to sending missionaries to the public school to teach religion, to, to, uh, to sell their brand of uh, Christianity. And uh, the Freedom from Religion Foundation stopped them. They hated the Freedom from Religion Foundation in town. <laughs> so, but anyway, so she said she would like to be supportive and uh, so, but she said, first I have this other project of Robert Ingersoll, and I thought I'd, be, I'd help her with that, find a foundation that would fix it. And, and if you can see in the lower right on this side before, you can see I'm unhappy because the sculpture's a mess. Uh, and, we got, and then I'm happier over there. But you, I came in the morning after it was delivered to the foundry and found insects all over the sculpture. And they were inappropriately praying mantises. But they were... <laughs> They were living in the sculpture, and they, they came, you can see it looks pregnant, and, it, and, it, and they all came out just after it got to, uh, to Philadelphia. So we put the bronze outside and let them all go off into the, into the uh, foliage. And there are a couple of people who are here with, you can see with the sculpture, I wanted to give it scale, so you can see it's back up on its pedestal. It's always good to have people in sculpture with uh, sculpture, so you can see how tall it is. And how so I needed somebody to help me put the sculpture up. It was just sitting in my studio. I was working on it. I had gotten some funding, and, uh, but I really needed somebody to help me, and it was hard to find anybody, a hero. Now, these, this didn't help me, but uh, <laughs> this is where I got my sponsorship from all of you. <laughs> Otherwise, the sculpture would still be sitting in my studio. And uh, so I went to, to uh, Dayton, Tennessee, and Tom Davis, the local historian, he was, he was there every day, or almost every day, and students would come, and this particular group was, I think, from a religious college, and he would talk to them, and I went dressed as Daryl, and I wanted to get the feeling of it. This is the actual courtroom in 1925 where evolution being taught in schools was argued, and he talked to them, and then I said, can I speak about Daryl, because he didn't talk about Daryl, <laughs> so um, he allowed me to, and I, and I did that. And then the next day, I stood in the spot where I thought the sculpture should go. And uh, I'm not on a pedestal, but otherwise it would be, it'd be realistic. Um, but uh, the thing, as I, when I left, I got in the car to go, and after I scouted out this site. 
and I saw another group of students come and stand in front of the uh, William James Bryan sculpture. And I saw them stand there for a little while, then they started to leave. So I jumped out of the car and I ran across the court, the yard there, the county courthouse. And I said, wait, wait, you've only heard half the story. <laughs> There's going to be another sculpture here of, of Clarence Darrow. And the teacher said, she, they were from Atlanta, it was a high school class, she said, tell us about him. So I talked about Clarence Darrow. And then as they left, I thought, I can't spend the rest of my life sitting in a car in the parking lot. <laughs> uh, jumping out, scaring kids, uh, telling them about Darrow. But if I had a sculpture here, if we could get it here, then um, it, it can do the talking for us. And it can tell people that, yes, there is Clarence Darrow, and there was the, uh, this, this idea of evolution, and, and get people talking. And you all know about Clarence Darrow. I, I love his, uh, I do not believe in God because I do not believe in Mother Goose. Um, he said a lot of great things. Um, he looked like he slept in his clothes because he did. Uh, he drank hard. He probably was somebody's wife. He, he drank hard. He was a womanizer, but he was a, he was the, he was a great uh, uh, lawyer. And I want him to look just like that, because unlike the other sculpture of William James Bryan, which was untrue, not just in the, in the uh, sculpture, but also in the argument that it was making for creationism, I wanted to show uh, Clarence Darrow the way he looked at 68 years old at the time of the, of the trial with his warts and all, you know, the baggy clothes, the clothes up, up to here, which I guess was the style. Uh, <clears throat> I think by that time, that was the middle of the jazz age, 1925, it probably wasn't quite that, but as like a lot of older people, it, he was still, he had a style from an earlier period. Uh, but you see, he's famous for his suspenders, which he used to snap when he was making a point. And so I, I had a lot of references. I found a lot of photos of him, and you can see him working on the models here, and there's Darwin inspiring me there in the background. And uh, even video. And I saw him doing this. It was covered very well by the media. In fact, this is the first time there was national radio, MGN, WGN from Chicago, who covered it. And uh, because I wanted to be realistic, I wanted to sculpt him the way he is on the, on the, with the long hair, because that's the way he was known. He was, he was kind of famous for that. But for this trial, he cut his hair, maybe he went to a local barber, and he got it cut short. It was very hot, and it wasn't going to look... Is it, I couldn't as easily get his likeness without that look, but I wanted it to be realistic. I wanted to show this was that moment in time. Again, because I wanted to show that the other sculpture didn't have that kind of credibility. So this is the trial, and you can see William James Bryan with the bald head there, and uh, Darrow with his arms folded. And I'm standing on the, the uh, platform. They had a wooden platform, which they've replaced, I think, once or twice because it rotted. And there's trees in the area that were there in 1925 that witnessed the trial. So these are some of my tools. Now the clay I'm using was from about that period, 1920s. Some of it is earlier. Some of it was used to make the Lincoln Memorial. It's an oil, it's a plastiline made from olive oil. And it's an old Italian plastiline, and it's passed down. I mean, when I die, it'll get passed down to another sculptor. So you use it over and over again. Um, and the tools are all handmade. It's not something you can go out and buy. In, the, in times past, sculptors made their own tools. They didn't go to a store and buy sculpture tools, just like paints. You know, you made your own paints. So you can see the skeleton. He's real. He's German, actually, but his nationality doesn't matter at this point, right? He shed that with his skin. Um, but uh, you can see some of the, the armature. is like a skeleton, in a sense. That's what you put the clay on. See, so that you can see that there on the right? And uh, this is a small model. So you start with a conceptual model. If you have an idea for, let's say, for a novel, many people will start with a little capsule idea that they write out. This, you start small because you want to be able to make changes. And if you, as you get larger, the armature has to be sturdier to hold up the larger piece. You can't make the changes as easily. So you want to, to start with a small piece. And uh, Margaret Downey said to me, it looks like he's pointing to heaven. That might not be a good... But one of the photos had him pointing up, so that's why I did that. Now, I was going to have a base that represented the Jurassic period and the various periods of evolution, so he could stand on his argument and put Lucy between, you know, the Lucy the uh, hominoid there between his shoes, but that got... We didn't have enough time. We kind of ran, started to run out of money. But you can see, when I went from the small model then to the scale model, so you step up before I get to seven feet... Uh, start with the nude. It's the way it's traditionally been done. So that way, he wears the clothes, the clothes don't wear him. So when you have a figure and you have folds, they follow the arm. Otherwise, if you just sculpt the clothes first, you can cut into the anatomy, cut into the biceps and so on. So that's why he's naked. I don't, it wasn't a kinky thing I was doing there. <laughs> but 
And I see the two. And now this one is a friend of mine. I was at his house. I visited him often, so I took my sculpture with me. I'll play a little bit of music. But um, so whenever I visited, I would take up my Daryl, and I visited off. And he would sit and play, play guitar and sing. And I would, uh, you can hear him? And I knew if I had my chance, there he is. And uh, so he would sing. You see him doing the dishes back there after we ate something. And um, I'm working on all parts of it, the, the head, the small figure. That's enough. It's a long song. You know? <laughs> he also played the banjo on this. He was, that was fun, too. Um, so you can see I worked on the head separately. You don't want to work up on a seven-foot head up on a... Uh, that high, it gets uncomfortable and over months. And this took two years to do. In fact, I'm compressing two years into maybe 20 minutes, if you're lucky. And uh, it's like taking a car and smashing it into a little, it's still all there, but it's not the same, right? In one of those compact. Uh, but so worked on the head separately. And uh, this is the enlargement. And I used to make the enlargement in the way it's been made since maybe the Renaissance. Is I would put up a structure and put the clay on and do that myself. But now you scan the smaller model and a foam is cut out that's roughly what you want to do and then I put clay on it. You can see. Now Lawrence Krauss was visiting the studio, he posed a little as did the man on the right, not Franklin but the other one. And uh, so I call this 3D, it's sort of a visual pun. And uh, you can see um, Darwin is on the left, Daryl's in the center and Dawkins is on the right. So it's 3D. So it's a little... <laughs> Um, and so uh, I decided the, instead of having that layered uh, base, which I think they would have refused to let me put in, one of the things they said to me from the beginning is they didn't want to see the name for, uh, Freedom from Religion Foundation anywhere on the base. <laughs> and, <laughs> and they didn't want uh, me to overshadow the other piece. They said, we don't want you to come in and overwhelm the other sculpture. And so the other sculpture is 10 feet tall with the base. So it has a four foot base and a six foot sculpture. Now, you really shouldn't do a six-foot sculpture outside because the air eats it up. It looks smaller than life. So I almost always do seven or more. And so what I did was I made a seven-foot base, a seven-foot sculpture on a three-foot base. So it made my sculpture a little larger than he is, than the other one. But it's subtle. But they're still the same height. So I technically stayed within the rules. Now this is a little colorized photo of them, but you can see what I used. I couldn't use that exact same photo, so I have uh, Darrow in profile because of the copyright issues. But I thought the back end of Clarence Darrow wasn't that interesting to, to me and probably most people, so I put a, that's where it was a good place to put the, the relief, so something to look at back there. Now this is the rubber mode. You pour rubber over the clay, you can see it's in segments, it looks like an uh, alien movie or something that's been covered there. And then you put plaster over the rubber, and it's called a mother mold because it's the, pla the rubber would, would just flop around. Otherwise, there's clay in there. Once you take the clay out, it would flop around. But the plaster holds the rubber like a mother holds a child. So it's called a mother, mother mold. And you pour wax. You take out the clay. And you pour wax into the rubber mold. And you pull these sections out. This girl at the foundry, uh, Leah, she's, you can see she's putting what's called sprues on the wax after they cast the wax. And that's how you deliver the bronze to the different parts the liquid bronze, the different parts of the sculpture. You have to have one on the end of the nose, and otherwise the, nose won't, the bronze won't get there. The bronze is melted, and as it moves, it cools. And when it, if it cools, it doesn't get to all the parts, then you only have a partial cast. Now, the interesting thing I hope for you is whether or not this is interesting to you as a, as a particular project, this is how almost all bronzes you see anywhere in the world are, were done. So that might be of, uh, of interest. And this is the foundry, Loran Bronze. You can see the pour. That's kind of fantastic to watch. As a, it's almost like a kind of birthing process. And they're pouring Daryl right there. And um, this is actually just, just before the pour, I, should, I have this a little out of order, you uh, dip the wax in a ceramic material. You can see the sprues. See, there's like a little cup at the top, and that's where you pour the bronze in. And then later, you have to cut those off. And you can see them over on the other side, too. But that's sort of the, the bottom of the Daryl. So, and there's wire in there because sometimes it'll explode while they're pouring. And I've been there and you have malted bronze kind of flying around and uh, you don't, that keeps it from, from doing that to some degree. Now here's the bronze pieces and this is the, uh, you know, putting, you have to put it together and it's got to clean it up. And this is how bronze looks when it's 
just cast. Now here it is, sandblast. It's still kind of flat looking. Bronze is not by itself that attractive. It's all welded together. And this is the patina process. You can see her up there. You see how it's changing color. And what that does, the patina helps protect the bronze outdoors. It also gives it a quality almost of skin of being able to look into it. It gives it a depth, especially when you add the wax. I'll show you in a moment. And you can, I made it green because I wanted it to look at least as old as the sculpture that was already there. Normally I would make it kind of a brown, but I wanted it to look like it belonged with the uh, William James Bride, even though they didn't have it there, you know, they didn't do it at the same time. So, uh, so it's patina on the left, and then when you add the wax, you have to think ahead when you're patining that you're patining it lighter than you're going to see it once it's fixed, because the wax darkens it. See, it's like when you're painting, you're doing glazes, you gotta make a painting lighter, and then when you glaze it, it darkens it, for those of you who are painters. And this is the relief. So I wanted, almost five minutes, okay. Not really compress it. Um, so uh, I wanted the relief to say, this is, I, you know, they were gonna, I, I thought they're not gonna be able to stop me from saying something that's in the transcript that actually was said in the trial. And I wanted to make a statement with the whole sculpture. So the relief says, Daryl asked uh, William James Bryan, do you think the earth was made in six days? And Brian said, not six days or 24 hours. So that was the checkmate moment. Because that allowed, because next thing Daryl said, well, how about 600,000 years? You know, then that allowed for evolution. And uh, so this is the other drama that was going on. While I was sculpting, this particular pastor over here, she's not carrying a Bible, but she's carrying a, a shotgun. She started threatening that she would meet me when the sculpture went up and she had a surprise for me. And she wasn't going to let it happen and she had her, sh her shotgun. And there were people praying that they didn't want the sculpture. See the prayer meeting? But there were some younger people there in the front who came and brought their sign, Welcome Clarence Darrell, which was encouraging. And you see up there the, the uh, P Tennessee Pastors Network. But uh, the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, newspapers from San Francisco to the East Coast covered it. So there's a lot of coverage. So there was a certain point, I think we we're there at this point, where I thought you know, the Freedom for Religion Foundation needs to get some publicity for this. They're paying for it. We're paying for it. And so I just said to Annie Lurie, let's just, let's just do it. We'll risk them stopping me from putting the sculpture up. And because uh, we were constantly working with the town. There are many people in the town that didn't want it, but gradually, like a 12, if you've seen the movie, uh, it was the 12 Angry Men, we were turning people over and they were saying, no, this is the right thing to do. So a lot of publicity it was, people saw it that I knew in Australia, these articles in several in England, in the Independent and other papers and in Canada. And so it got a lot of publicity. I hope, for the, I think, for the Freedom from Religion Foundation. And uh, this was, Kevin Spacey was playing um, Clarence Darrow in, in New York, and he picked up one of the articles, and he tweeted about it and said that it was a thing that needed to happen. You can see his little tweet up there. And then my cat wanted to come with me when I went to, uh, <laughs> to Tennessee. <laughs> uh, empty pedestal. Gets kind of, uh, but you can see I meant the pedestal to look better than his. He had a concrete pedestal. So it was a little ways to overwhelm to, to compete with, to, to make it better. <laughs> but you can see the warm brick and the, and the warm uh, stone and then the uh, rough stone at the bottom that matches the bottom of that. So there's a kind of a visual rhyme. It looks like it belongs. Now this is how I was moved. I didn't have pictures of the Daryl being moved because the people, the foundry put it in a couple hours earlier than they said they would. And um, I wasn't even there because they were afraid that they might get shot. So they knew people thought they would be there at 8, they got there at 6. And so by the time I got there, they were just putting in the, uh, the relief, and then we had about 200 people there, and Margaret was the MC. Dan played. I see the man on the right of Dan over there, or he's to the left of Dan, but all right. I'll mention him again later. It's Andy Laurie speaking, and he wrote the book, and he, he was wonderful. Uh, or at least he was acting wonderful, he's a great actor. And, uh, <laughs> And I spoke a little, and then this is the piece, and it's mystery. And then the, you heard yesterday, if you were here, about the drama of trying to get this off the... <laughs> it took about five minutes. And at this point, I turned to the crowd and said, it took me less time to make it than it's taken to unveil it. <laughs> and uh, so there it is in bronze. It's there. Um, and that's the bodyguard, the armed bodyguard that Margaret uh, got somebody to, to pay for and secured. And, there are probably a lot of people carrying guns. It's one of those states, but he was on our side. <laughs> so, 
And uh, that's uh, Rosalie, she's uh, an ex-wife, business partner, and she's the one who worked with this man, who's a Christian and a creationist. I didn't know he was a Christian and a creationist until the last day. He helped me put the sculpture in, because he was a historian first. He thought it should go there. So I thought that was a nice thing, you know, a nice thing to, to find. Um, and he helped talk to the other people who were a little bit more, uh, you know, they were zealots, and, and he talked them down. But... Um, he told me, well, the project almost died about seven times, and that Rosalie uh, and uh, my business partner, and he pulled it back. And then there was a lot of publicity, it said New York Times, TV, and now you see the two of them together, and uh, his arm's too long on his, you see that? It's yeah. <laughs> well, as a sculptor, you know, he came up to me at one point, and he said, these people don't know I'm actually an atheist, which is kind of funny, but he was doing what they told him to do. And now you see the two of them together, and, uh, and, and this, you saw the other photo. Now, you know, you, sometimes you can't take a piece down, but what you can do, and you know, there's this argument going now with, with sculptures uh, that shouldn't be there, you can reappropriate them. And that's what I wanted to do. I wanted, I thought, and Freedom from Religion Foundation made it happen, if we could put the Daryl there without removing him, now it's not a sculpture that's preaching, it's a sculpture that's part of a historical narrative. So we redefined it. And now forever, and people go there and they take their classrooms there, they're going to have to answer to him. They're going to have to address it. I think that's it. Thank you.